All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today we were just having a conversation before we hit record here, and I'm super excited about the guest that I've uh, lined up for you to hear today. So I, if you may or may not know with the podcast, I am actually, I just turned 50. So I'm actually in the part of my life where I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is life going to look like as I get closer to my own personal retirement uh, income? How am I going to produce enough income in my life to obviously meet my needs, to obviously live the life that I desire? which is a big passionate subject that I try to, number one, try to figure out for myself, but then I'm obviously trying to find guests that we can have conversations with to try to help and add as much value to you, the listeners, as we possibly can, which is why I'm super excited about the guest I've brought on here today. Today, I've got Steve Selengut. Steve is coming to us actually from Charleston, South Carolina, so I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. He's actually a retirement income coach. He's the author of Retirement Money Secrets, which he sent me a copy, and I truly appreciate that. Let me tell you right off the bat, I've got a copy of it right here. Appreciate you sending me that copy of that book. Inside of it, he discusses the six basic principles needed to create an income-producing portfolio, no matter what the market is doing. And I think we talked about, we're going to try to talk about some of the ups and downs of the markets and how his philosophy in investing is something that actually can uh, be beneficial when the market is volatile, as we've seen here in the last past few years. So Steve has a 40 plus year career as a professional investment manager, and he's personally managed over 325 portfolios where he's helped his clients earn income uh, through their portfolios, which is super, super exciting. So today he focuses on helping his students create income producing investment portfolios for retirement without dipping into the principal. And we'll discuss about what that means as well. So without further ado, super excited about this conversation. Steve, I appreciate you joining us here on the Rich Mind Podcast. Well, thank you, Randy. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's going to be a lot of fun. So today I- Where would you like to start? (laughs) Yeah. So I mentioned a lot of the kind of the 30,000 foot view, some of the bullet points about yourself, but I would love for you to take a few minutes and just give us some of the backstory. Tell us a little bit more so we can get to know you a little bit better. Well, um, well, as as you said, I, I I've been doing this for a long time. I actually um, was one of those fortunate people, I guess. Uh, I was 25. I was out of college. I was starting a career with a a company that was stationed in New York, um, where where I was working and commuting New York from North Jersey, and. Uh, I I had thrust upon me a uh, um, it's it's a, some it's a problem that most people would love to have you know I had thrust upon me a whole bunch of stock certificates and I was still, was told look uh, I've been taking care of you all these years now it's your turn here's something you can start with and uh, there I was I had a portfolio of uh, high quality big board uh, blue chip stocks most people would think of them as uh, household name stocks like. IBM and General Electric, General Motors, things like that. Think think back that this was back in 1970. So the names I'm saying, there were no Googles, Amazons, and et cetera back then. These were more brick and mortar type companies, not so much service companies as much as they were manufacturing companies and, and things like that. But still, they had a few things in common. They were high quality. They paid dividends. Um, they'd been in business and were profitable for decades, you know, and so on. So there were. It wasn't that I was um, starting off with any type of speculation in mind. It was all, you know, the quality type stuff. And as I, as I studied it and, and looked at the charts, we all look at and about how these these things fluctuate in price and in market value over the years and just go up and down, go up and down, go up and down. You could see uh, if you put a ruler to it and you looked for a trading range, it's, and it's an upward flowing trading range, admittedly, but a trading range, you could see opportunities where you could have bought Royal Dutch Petroleum at twenty dollars a share and sold it at twenty six dollars a share and then again bought it at twenty four dollars and sold it at twenty nine and this type of sequentially 
trading this thing time and time again, uh, where you could see, hey, wait a minute, not only do I get the dividends, but I can also get a capital gain profit on these things. And I really don't have to change the names of the ones I'm dealing with. I just buy them again. And there's this, the market seems to go up and down um, regularly, but not predictably. And so that's what I did. I started trading these things and trading them. And then I, then I, I, um, for some reason, I decided that I wanted to have something in the bond markets as well. And um, so I started buying tax-free municipal bonds. Uh, with When I take make a, a, a nice substantial profit, I'd put some of the money into municipal bonds. And uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, 4% coupon bond was my first one. I, I probably said a few words already. Coupons don't exist anymore. Uh, you know, and the difference between bonds and stocks might be a little uh, fuzzy because most people deal with ETFs and mutual funds, so they don't really know or realize what's inside them and which ones are better, are safer, and which ones are purposed for income and which ones are purposed for growth. But we can get further than that. You want, but push comes to shove, and and make it a longer, a too long of a story shorter. Uh, by the time I, in 1979, by the time I was 34 years old, I was making more from these portfolios in dividends and capital gains, five times more than my bosses were paying me to commute to New York and work for them. So it was time to say, see you fellas, I, I think I can, I think I know what I'm doing here. I think I can do this for other people. And that's what I'm going to do. And I because I had the income, I, I, I was able to support myself long enough to get a, a, a new business up and running. And that's what I did. Um, and I focused my growth. I grew my portfolios by the income I produced within them. So even though they fluctuated in price, just like they do today, um, if you have a company that's paying you a dividend of 4% and its market value goes down, typically that has no impact on the dividend that it's paying out quarterly. If you have portfolios, if you have, if you own bonds or you own uh, Ginny Mays, I think most people remember Ginny Mays, um, they pay principal and interest on a regular basis. The fact that their prices go up and down have no impact on the income they're paying. So, Knowing those things, you could see how as long as you don't spend more money than you make and you reinvest that income, it's just like the bank account your parents told you about. Put it in there, Sonny, and you'll see the interest coming in every month, you know, and you'll see that compounding and compounding. And that's how you grow a future future wealth is through compound interest. Well, I do it through super compounding distribution income and capital gains. And, um, and stuff like that. And that's that's really worked out well. And um, over the years, the income just kept growing and growing and growing. And my clients experienced the same thing. And uh, as uh, uh, I think you mentioned, you know, the business grew to the point where I had, you know, $110 million under management for 135, 45 clients throughout the country and the world. Uh, which I sold last May, a year ago, a little more than a year ago now. Uh, and I'm now, and what I'm now doing is talking to individuals and professionals about how you can or how you can teach your clients to generate more than enough income to to spend that four. That 4% of a portfolio, that's the common denominator for retirement. You're going to spend 4% of your assets every year. And if you can generate that in income, uh, then you never have to you never have to sell any of those assets. You never have to dip into principal. And um, my daddy told me that that's a good thing. Don't ever invade your principal. You know? So anyway, that's that's the story of where I am. And and um, if you think about those concepts and others we can talk about, it's really worked well. I mean, there have been four, 
three and a half major meltdowns in in my history, going back to 1987. You had 87, the 2000.com. You had the, the, quote, Great Recession. I think they got a little carried away with themselves, trying to make it sound like the Great Depression, which was really a big deal, much more so. And that little, little bitty two month deal we had uh, in the COVID crisis, you know, but if you think about it, if you were to look at the numbers, if you, the income never changed. In fact, every time the, every time the market falls, every time the portfolios go down in price, it's an opportunity to, further grow your income because you can then buy those same securities cheaper and at a higher yield because believe it or not none of them almost none of them really pay missed missed a dividend or cut their dividends during any of those crises in the financial crisis is the one exception and because it was focused so much in the banking and financial industry there were there were bankruptcies. There were collapses in companies like Merrill Lynch, for example, where the things went out of business. But overall, if you had a properly diversified portfolio, that would have wouldn't that would have been about as painful as getting um, a COVID injection, you know, and a momentary <laughs> little pick, and it went away, and it didn't bother you. But of course, if you had all your money in Merrill Lynch, then you had a problem. But uh, we don't do things that way. We don't do things that way. And I would say that your philosophy with your investment philosophy and thesis is more you're investing for income. You're not necessarily investing for the growth of the principal, even though that might be a byproduct of that. But you're specifically investing to try to grow your income. Can you even so it's just different than what people might be even listening to or even hearing out there in the normal you know day to day activities. Yeah, mo most investors and most investment firms focus on growing market value. You know, this is what makes you feel good. This is the ego boost of I'm rich, you know, my portfolio. Uh, I've got a million dollars worth of Microsoft. And when they when you ask them, well, how much does it pay in dividends that you can spend every year? And you look strangely and say to them, well, it doesn't pay anything at all. You know, I have to sell it in order to buy a new car, or, you know, or go shopping for that matter. You know, so that's the distinction. I, I buy the same types of companies um, that everybody's buying today. This is, this is the current era, uh, 1990s on. I've been buying things called closed end funds, which are which are actually the oldest form of fund in the uh, financial area. They've been around since the early 1800s. Uh, mutual funds didn't start until a little bit later in the 1800s. And ETFs are our babies. They're not even out of their diapers. They started like in the 1990s. You know, so the, dis the, the primary and most important distinction about closed-end funds is that they're trust vehicles. And I'm sure many of you have trusts for your your heirs or you've set up trusts in your wills and estates and things like that. These are passed through trusts and they are required by law to continue not to pay any taxes to um, to disperse 95% of all the income they realize to their shareholders. Now just imagine if Amazon had to pay 95% of its profits to its shareholders. You know It'd be a different world. That's it would sure. be a different world. It would be a different world. It might be even a more inflationary world, but who knows? You that's know, true. when you think about it, it might not be a good thing. So, but but that's the idea. And that's why closed-end funds are so easy to use when you have an income focus. And when you think about it, in these terms, if I can make, I think I'm repeating myself now, but if I can make 10, 15, 20% more in income than I need to spend. And I reinvest that in the same types of securities. They're going to make that, in, that it's going to make that income even bigger each year. So that's the objective of the exercise is to, uh, 
when I used to manage money for other people, I told them, if you, you know, if you spend less than 60 to 70 percent of the income I produce, I'll be able to continue to grow that income for you. And that's what I did. And right now I try to do that for myself, but I'm not quite as successful because I'm, I'm traveling a lot. You know, <laughs> and that that eventually digs into it. But still, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, that type of a, a focus will get you where you want to be in retirement. So why is it that we we and I say that as collective, those of us listening have not necessarily heard of closed ended funds. If somebody's listening to this today and it's like rewinding is like, what did he say? Closed ended funds. What in the world is that? Why is this not something or why, you know, I just learned about it when you shared your book with me and you've been learning about and using these vehicles since you said the late seventies. I mean, why in the world in 2024 are we just finding out about this? Uh, I can, you know, I, I don't want to, let's put it this way. The purpose of closed end funds is let, let's, let's reverse. Let's go back to Amazon again. If Amazon were forced, if Walmart, if anybody, Pfizer were forced to um, give out 95% of its earnings, would it have grown to the size it is now? Of course not, right? Because it's going back into, it's building more factories, it's, it's discovering more products, whichever, it's putting more, building more stores. So that's not what closed-end funds are doing. They're, they're, they're tasked with giving their profits back to their shareholders. So they don't do that. They have five, per, after expenses, they have 5% left that they can reinvest. And what they reinvest in is more securities. They buy more, more of what they're buying. So they'll buy more stocks or mob, more bonds, whatever the focus of this particular fund is. So that's, so they're not going to grow. I mean, you can't, I have, I have 240 closed end funds and I would say that not, 15 of them have ever had a price above $30 ever, ever. And some of them have been around a hundred years. Some of them have been around 70, 60 years because they can't, I mean, you just can't get there. It's just not a road that leads up a mountain. It's a road that just keeps you on a path to income. So one of the reasons, and um, I'm not saying this about, any individual advisors or anything like that, but individual advisors are paid on the basis of what they call AUM or amount under management, assets under management. And assets under management do not grow as quickly in an income focused environment as they do in a market value focused environment. And I'll leave it at that. Anything uh, you can think about, about fiduciary responsibility and the like, that's not uh, something I want to discuss. But it's the practical idea that when you use closed-end funds, your focus better be income. And over the years, if interest rates move lower like they did from 2008 until 2020, you know, lower and lower until almost zero, you're going to see a rise in price, a rise in increase in closed end funds as well, because they become more popular because, you know, their their yields are, are so high. But generally speaking, as soon as those interest rates go back up, you're going to see pressure on those prices to go down as, as they have in the last two years. So just the inverse, we talked briefly, I don't know if folks understand that how when prices rise, the yield or the interest is going to decrease, right? And vice versa. That's that's just typically right. how the market's- I mean, the yeah. amount of money stays the same, but when you do the math, it changes, the yield changes. So, so are these vehicles or the closed-ended funds, are they- So a lot of folks might be in typical retirement accounts, right? Whether it's a 401k or, or whatever type of vehicle they're using with wherever employment they might have, or even if they're self-employed, where, it, where can you learn about the closed ended funds? And then is, are they available within different uh, programs that are typically used out there today? Mm, uh, in the first answer to the first question, the way to learn about them is through the book called Retirement Money Secrets. Yes, we have which, that right here, folks. Which is, Retirement Money Secrets, get which, your copy. 
by yours truly. And I explain all about the uh, closed end funds, but there are other books about that. There's a book called the income factory by another Steve um, who talks about um, closed end funds, but he keeps the closed end funds in a um, more of a, set it and forget it type mode where you would reinvest the dividends and, and, you know, hopefully the, the value is, would grow and stuff like that. He's not a big on profit taking like I am. I'm, I'm looking for two streams of income. Most people are looking for one. Okay. I'm looking for distributions, the dividends and the capital gains I can get from trading this select group, this select universe of quality, um, CEFs I've developed, you know, so, and of course you can look it up, look up closed end funds and uh, you can find out all about them. There are also Facebook groups, one of which I, I own or own, I manage um, that deal with it. And uh, there's lots of healthy discussion within them about what they are and how they operate and so on. So there's a lot of people now out there that know about them. But you're not going to you're not going to call up your investment advisor and say, hey, I want to get into um, closed end funds and get anything but silence on the other end of the line. Yeah. Right, because they don't know much about it, just like they I don't know much about you. it because yeah. and it's on, and it's not their fault. They haven't been given the opportunity. Most of them are given a set of funds and a set of stocks that the research departments have come up with that are fine for their clients. These days, they're given a batch of model portfolios. This portfolio is for the 60-year-old man with a younger wife and three kids. This one's for one with an older wife and four kids. You know, model portfolios for everything, but they're all the same. And none of them are focused on income. It's all on market value growth. Which is completely opposite of, of what you're teaching. Which is totally different from what I'm teaching. I'm teaching get the income take those Viking cruises once a year and you'll still have enough money left over to take care of the kids' birthdays and your granddaughter's college education. Yeah. Love it. Love it. That's awesome. So how active does someone need to become? Meaning if it's not, yeah, just out of yeah, curiosity, how much you mentioned as far as you've taken some time off. And when, so maybe you're not necessarily seeing the activity or the positive gains or, or, or the income increase that you're looking for. How, you know, how does that work? Um, there's a lot of things you can do today with technology. And I know a lot of people in the Facebook groups that I manage will do it this way. They'll set a uh, sell limit. If, if any one of the securities in my portfolio, they can even go so far as to say, if any of the lots inside a security, meaning the tax lots, ones I bought earlier in the year or whatever, become a 5% profit, it's an automatic sell. You just sell it. And then your only task is to make sure you get on your app while you're in Lisbon and say, okay, I've got this much cash available. I have to go buy something, you know, and you do it or you call up, so you, you call up a broker and say, even if you have to call up your broker at Schwab or Fidelity to do a trade from anywhere in the world, it's only going to cost you, you know, that's the only commission there is anymore. And it'll be like $30. And, and you know, if you want to, otherwise you wait to get home and spend money. Right now is a good time to do it, folks, because today we have 5% money market rates. Okay. And so while you're, while the money is sitting around, it's working pretty hard. It's working harder. It's working twice as hard as the average yield on the average mutual fund or ETF out there in the money market. Just, fund. just yeah. holding it in the market, money market fund. today, today at 5%. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's an interesting way of going about investing and, um, and preparing for retirement and so on. It can be as active as you want it to be. I do not, I do not, I do not believe in automatic reinvestment because you will at times be paying more than your average cost. And what that does actually is reduce your yield on a position and raise your cost, which is a no, no in my, between my years it is anyway. So I always, I always take the money and each, each, most of these things pay on 
the first of the month or the last of the month. So within these two days, which I call D days, distribution days, you have all this cash and you can invest it. And then the rest of the time you can sleep. You don't need to even bother looking at it anymore. So if someone's out there thinking about even beginning the process of learning about these closed ended funds and that type of thing, you obviously the book would be a number one resource for them to go learn. You talked about different Facebook groups and things like, like that. Are there specific, uh, if they were to, to go talk to their current person that's helping them with their finances, is there anything to mention to them or anything to help them uh, try to get that dialogue going to help them uh, yeah. start taking back control? Um, I think so. And um <laughs> I guess what you got to tell them is, hey, there are ways to generate more income. And I, you know, I appreciate that your focus is on uh, growing my market value. And right now you're doing an excellent job. But what about the times when it's out of your control? What about in the COVID crisis? What about in, you know, the um, Great Recession? What about in the dot-com bubble? What about in the crash of 87, you know, where was my 4% in, where was my 4% of portfolio going to come from? And was 4% of a portfolio that's down 60% going to be enough to pay my bills? Or would I had to spend 8% at that time and take even more out? So then when it grew back, it was growing back from a lower base. So even if it went up from 40 to 40% after the crash of 87, it was from, you know, this much less that I had to spend there, this much less because I had to spend so much more and sell so much more at losses. You know, so it's a whole different, it's a, just a whole different approach. You, you know, you, if you started with the income, I ha, I've been an income investor since day one. In 87, and 87, if you'll, most of you won't recall, that's right, but as it happens, they say, they tell you in the history books <laughs> that in 87, the market crashed and it went down a serious 50 or 60 percent. This is one that I think, I think that the S&P wasn't even at a thousand yet in those days. The Dow, I don't think was 3000 or anything. I could look it up. But anyway, the numbers weren't nearly as big as they are now. But so it went down 40 or 50 percent on October 19th, which happens to be my brother's birthday. And I always rub that in his face. So <laughs> on, it, on my brother's birthday, the market crashed <laughs> and um, and the market went down a lot much. And this was back in the time when they first started using um, computers and robots, robot robot-ish computer programs and they'd have these selling programs and my and to me i think all that happened was it was a giant giant spiral caused by these programs that kept selling at a lower and lower price while everything sold and while me and me and my broker were just buying everything in sight i mean really and i was totally pretty much only in stocks then we'd put Hey, what's the price of Pepsi? Oh, Ken will say, hey, it's it's down to 28. I said, put it in at 18, see if we can get a few hundred shares of it, you know, that type of thing. It was craziness that day. And uh, that's what we did. We just bought and bought and bought. And then within 18 months, everything was right back where it was and higher. And we were, and the income never changed. And we didn't sell anything because the prices were down because everything were these quality securities that I talked about right at the get-go, you know, the big companies, the big names, companies that were going to be able to withstand a small financial crisis or two. And um, there, there are really four things you gotta, you've got to do before you go into any kind of vesting, whether it's closed-end funds or common stocks or mutual funds, ETFs. You notice I didn't mention anything else I – would have would have mentioned would not have been an investment it would have been a speculation okay we're talking about investing here you know uh we're not going to the casino we're 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 going to real things anyway um so if you have these four things that you do when you start to invest right from the get-go you know don't let anybody talk you out of it 
you could even ask your broker if he's done this with the things that you that he's bought for you. Um, the quality you have to come up with uh, ways to determine the quality. To me, in closed end funds, um, it's got to be in business for five years. It's got to pay the regular distribution for all that time. It's got to have a large number of securities inside. If it's in, for example, if it's an equity security. Uh, CEF, it's got to own at least 50 different companies. And many of them I better know the names of. Uh, the average one owns almost 200 companies. So, you know, it's really a no brainer type diversification tactic as well. But that's the quality element. In the old days when I was just doing stocks, it was low PE ratio and a debt to, debt to equity ratio that made sense. Um, you know, that type of thing. So. And an S S and P used to rate used to rate individual stocks in those days as investment grade. And and interestingly enough, if you were B plus or better, it was investment grade. And in order to be B plus or better, you had to pay a dividend. Hmm. So Microsoft was never B plus or better until it was maybe 45, 50 years old when it first started paying dividends. Go figure. So anyway, quality. Another thing you have to do in your portfolio is diversify. You want to diversify to the point that if anything you own goes to zero, your wife isn't going to throw things at you. Okay. <laughs> it's not going to be that big a number that she's going to even notice. Okay. So keep it, keep it down. And the maximum anything should ever be is 5%. And I would bet you that there's a lot of people looking at their accounts right now and seeing that they have mutual funds or ETFs that are the composite, maybe 20% of their portfolio in one symbol. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Bad diversification. So diversification is the second pillar of this stool of risk minimization that you have to have. The third one coming from me, of course, is income production. You know, you, it's got to pay you some kind, of, some kind of income. And the final one, the final pillar is profit taking. Because you've all experienced what happens when you don't take your profits. You've all got, um, let's say, bruises in places because of kicking yourself after you didn't take a profit on one of those companies and it went down 40% overnight because they didn't double their profits this quarter like they had the previous two. You got to take your profits and you got to set a target. When I was doing stocks, my target was 10%. If something went up 10%, I was out of it. With closed-end funds, it's 5%. Now, that's going to vary with market conditions, but you get the idea. So those are the four pillars. If you do those things and then and you recognize that the market and interest rates, economies, everything is cyclical, and there's the market goes up and down, and you should – Try to determine where you are in that cycle. Right now, it's obvious where you are in the stock market cycle. Day before yesterday, every average hit an all-time high. Today, last I looked, every average is at an all-time high. Okay? Where are you in the market cycle? You're at the very top. Okay? You don't know if it's going to go higher. You don't know when it's going to go down, but it will. OK, so when you're buying your stocks or you're buying your closed end funds that are in stocks, you don't buy the ones that are at an all time high. And when when you buy them, you buy less than you normally would because, you know, you're going to be able to buy some more at a lower price. You know, so you work with this market cycle because, you know, it's always going to happen. You can go back as far as you want, as far as you want. It always has. Just like it did in 87. What, ha what happened in 2000? In 2000, the world fell in love with tech. And the NASDAQ is where all the tech companies went. And um, they just went crazy. It went up and up and up and up. Um, just like it was going to happen forever. And, and a lot of people thought it would happen forever. Clients left me because I wasn't buying NASDAQ companies. They mm -hmm. did. They just, my, this guy always picks winners. You've got to be there. I'm, I'm leaving you. I'm sorry, Steve, but I'm gone. So go ahead. You know, 
Don't call me. Don't call me when you when it goes down. Can't go down. He can't go down. Tech is here to stay. And then all of a sudden it wasn't anymore. You know? So, you know, that's the, the way it was. I mean, I was stuck in my ways and I was getting yelled at, and people throwing things at me, but I I was stubborn. So so you had that one. And then of course we had the financial crisis, which was in another sector of the market whereas the financials that really took a, took a beating and and a lot of them went under but over overall um except for those few little injections when when the Merrill Lynch went under or the uh, Lehman Brothers went under which I happened to own for some clients in very small portions that was it money kept rolling in the income kept coming closed end funds didn't change their distributions at all, you know? So as long as you're prepared, those four pillars I spoke of, and you recognize that you're in a cyclical environment, you can deal with anything the stock market throws at you and be smiling the whole Love. time. And be smiling the whole time, which is a huge benefit. Like you said, to keep your wife from throwing things at you. Imagine that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fantastic. So one of your pillars you're talking about was taking profit. Right. So one thing I'm thinking of in my mind is that I was taught, and I'm sure a lot of folks might be out there as well, is like you buy and hold. You just don't sell. Talk to me about how you're actively trading these for a profit. And that's part of the process of gaining this income. And maybe the little yeah. pushback you might have for that from a tax standpoint or anything like that. Well, the tax, you know, um, if I always tell people, if your boss came in to your office or your cubicle, whatever it is. And he said to you, I got a 5,000, I'm going to give you a $5,000 bonus. And you would you say to him, oh, no, baby, I'll have to pay a lot of taxes on that. I'm not taking it. I don't want it. Give it to somebody else. The same thing with a, a profit that's sitting out there on a stock that you love. Uh, you know, and it's it's there. If you don't take it, It'll be taken away from you eventually. There's only there's very few instances where a company has just gone up and stayed up compared. Sure, there are a lot of them. Those are ones in that quality talk I was telling you about. Those are the ones that are like that. But there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands even of companies that start out and we don't know where they're going. Very few make it to the top. Very few. So um, don't get caught up in the idea that you or anybody you talk to or anybody you listen to on the radio or TV is going to pick the next Amazon or the next Google or the, you know, the next Apple. You know, it, it's a matter of luck at that point, guessing which one's going to get there. So. As far as the portfolio size, is there a minimum number that to get start with or is it really can you start with? Yeah, I'll just I'll just even leave it. The question is that I mean, what is there a yeah. minimum to start with that that really makes this effective, or or does that matter? Well, it's it's effective. You know, the numbers are small. You know, if you have, yeah, you, know, you can you can go about out and buy a hundred shares of CEF for five hundred dollars. You know, and and own a portfolio of securities, either income securities or equity securities. Uh, for me, if most people are getting started, let's say they have under fifty thousand dollars. Instead of trying to hit it big in the stock market, they should really focus on the income securities because they're just naturally safer. Uh, in case you don't know, stocks and bonds are the two ways that corporations fund their operations. They sell um, stocks in an initial public offering to investors, and they own a piece of the action. They own an actual ownership share of the companies. Um, you don't get the kind of pay and dividends that the chief executives get, trust me, but you do get something, maybe, and you do own, own a company, but ownership has its downsides, okay? And this is, and the difference is how, how they're treated versus debt holders. If you loan money to the corporation in the form of buying a bond or of a a preferred stock, which is sort of a hybrid of a stock and a, bra a bond, when that company gets in trouble, they have to pay the bondholders and the preferred stockholders everything they owe them, every penny. 
before one cent goes to any stockholder. And that includes the chief executives. Okay. So that's something to think about. You should. So when you're just getting started and you can't afford a loss of any nature and a loss, an, an actual financial loss, not just a market value loss, you should think about buying things in the debt markets, preferred shares, uh, bonds, government securities and stuff like that. And if you do it all in the form of closed end funds, you'll instantly have a diversified portfolio that pays a large amount of income and you don't have any of the other awkward Awkward. facts that you have to deal with when you're using bonds. You don't have to worry about bids and ask prices and you don't have to worry if there's a market and you just, there's nothing to worry about. You can do it like trading a stock. You can trade bonds, which uh, most people who have traded bonds know what a hassle it is to deal with them. So it sounds like it's obviously a simpler, or I say obvious, maybe it is, it's or it's a, not, right? It's but it cer- sounds like it's, it's just certainly a, simpler, a simpler way to get into the fixed income markets uh, with the closed end funds. And it's easier to, you can trade them just like stocks. And, you know, if it goes up 5%, you sell it and you find another one. There's so many of them. So yeah, uh, this type of investing is particularly good for people starting out and for people who are approaching retirement. In, in the middle Uh, The excitement of the stock market uh, may just be overwhelming, but I would recommend that people start putting something away for their future in a safer environment. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a, uh, I'm not there to make the big hits. I'm there to do it with income. And in a year like 2021, um, for example, which is the, Last great year we've had in pretty much all markets, interest rates hadn't started to rise yet. The market just went crazy um, for most of the year. Um, my clients made 7% in distributions and another 7% in capital gains in that year. So I like to, I used to tell them, uh, my objective is to make more in capital gains than you pay me in fees. So in 2021 and loan, we made them about four and a half years worth of fees in capital gains. So that was really a vol. So we're, we've been in a volatile market, right? And sometimes people shy away from volatility, whereas this volatility can create some potential gains or, you know I mean? You right. buy and you sell when you're tr- actively trading. Talk about that even a little bit more, how the volatility well, is actually your friend. You're versus very, something to you're, be fearful v, of. you're VBF, right? Your very best friend. Volatility is, yeah. it is absolutely. I mean, it's the most, it's the best thing about um, the stock market. Actually. I mean, I would be, I was doing the same thing when I was just in, in individual stocks. Most you couldn't do that with bonds and preferred stocks. It just didn't work because they didn't have that range. But on a smaller scale, the closed-end funds have a range enough for a 5% target, and you can do the same ones over and over again. Uh, And they have the same volatility. There'll be people that tell you they have more volatility because of this one unique feature they have. But I will tell you they have the volatility because of another unique feature they have. Uh, the, the, The unique feature that actually calls, uh, causes the volatility to me um, is there, the fact that they're a closed end, which means they issue a certain number of shares and that's it, baby. They're not going to issue any more. They're not going to have splits. They're not going to have, you know, uh, send out more shares, not going to have secondary offers. The only thing they're going to do for some people is reinvest dividend reinvestment. And I'm not sure they issue new shares for that. I'm pretty sure they, those are um, what they call treasury shares or something like that. And that, and that's what gives them the volatility because you have a company like Amazon that literally probably has a billion or more shares out there, you know, and most of them have hundreds and hundreds of millions or a billion shares, these major companies, but Closed end funds have a much smaller float, and consequently, there's uh, 
Well, there are a lot of people out there too, like me, that don't sell them unless they're at a profit. So you're not, you know, we have a floor, you know, but there, there are so few that the supply and demand, the, the, the bid and ask prices will be different, be a bigger spread than when there's a, a hundred thousand shares available today. There's never a hundred. You can't go out and buy a hundred thousand shares of a closed end fund in one lump. I don't believe. It'd be, you'd have a tough time doing it. So it's it's a different type of animal, and that's what causes volatility. Other people think um, that the volatility is called um, – let me ask a question first. Randy, do you think major corporations, your Walmarts, your others, ever borrow money to fund their operations? <laughs> I would say – Yes. Okay. What about often. what about real estate investors? You think people go out and spend their own cash when they buy an apartment complex? Do investors or do they borrow money? It's it's OPM. It's other people's other money. People's money. The, yeah, so they borrow money to support borrow. their operations. Their operations, some are to build more factories or open another McDonald's or to put more clothing on their shelves or, you know, whatever. The closed-end fund manager borrows money to buy more securities, okay? So he's not, he's not taking a margin loan ab- against his Fidelity account. He's borrowing money as an organization, as a trust, as a company, and saying to this bank, loan me some money. And they're saying, oh, fine, okay, we'll loan and he's taking that money and he's investing it in securities that will pay him more income than the interest that he is paying to the bank. If the bank won't loan him money at an interest that makes that possible, there's nothing making him borrow that money. A lot of people will tell you um, that that's one of the big problems with closed end funds is that they use leverage which is exactly the same thing we were talking about with Walmart and all the others that borrow money and real estate people. Borrowing money is borrowing money. It doesn't need to have the dirty word leverage associated with it. And all it's doing is buying more shares of stock, more bonds or whatever to give you more income, you know, and they're not going to do it if they can't get more than they're spending in interest. So it's, it's maybe the image is causing the volatility, but it's it's not the fact that they borrow money that's causing the volatility. So leverage is a tool, and if used correctly, it can obviously obviously yeah. exponentially grow your gains, yep. right? Which those with these closed ended funds, they're sharing those gains with you as far as this income. That's is that is that what I'm hearing? Yes, basically, that's correct. Yeah, which then gives you the opportunity to earn more uh, in a shorter period of time. Right. And that's, and earning money in a shorter period of time is why I, I find the profit taking so exciting and and so important. It's, um, it's like an accelerator, you know, you take, let's say you have a portfolio, any portfolio, and it's yielding 10%. So the average, you've got 200 different stocks, these stocks happen to be closed-end funds, but they're stocks. You got 200. The average yield is 10%. And that's not a pipe dream. That's really about where it is right now. Okay? So any one of those is yielding, is paying you 0.75% a month. So the market goes up, or this stock goes up in price 4%. That's more than three and a half months income. And you can take that money and you can buy another one that's just like it. Different name, different everything, but it's yielding 10%. You buy another one. You know, but you've you've taken, you've got in your hands the equivalent of four months of income from this particular symbol. That's what's all it is. It's a symbol. After a while, you get to feel that way. You know, you, you love them all, you know. There's not one that's any better. You'll find that some seem to have more of these profit opportunities than others. So you'll naturally gravitate to them. If you don't own it, you'll want to own it again. And they, and you do this over and over and over. And I'm telling you, uh, you know, I, I've made, okay, and I won't even use any numbers, but just the idea 
um, most most brokerage statements will give you a breakdown of what your projected income is for the next 12 months. And most of it is really minuscule amounts because they don't focus on it. But mine is a pretty substantial figure. And I've already, so far this year, I'm working on, I've already got two months, ex, two extra months of income in the pocket. And I'm working on my third month of extra income right now. So my year is already going to be 14 months long. It'll probably be 16 or 17 months long by the time. But that's that's a significant thing. You're getting, you know, four or five additional months of income, you know, from your portfolio. And put that in put it put that into the perspective of the number you're saying you're gonna have ready in your portfolios when you retire. And it's gonna enter it's going to generate this kind of income. Wow. And then say on top of that, if I, if I read this book, this guy's talking about, if I use that book, I could have an extra two, three, even just one would be plenty, you know, extra income just from taking profits when they happen. So it's, it's, it's an exciting way to look at what most people would call a more conservative, less speculative means of investing. An income-focused investment environment is not anything I, or anybody on Wall Street to say is exciting. But I make it exciting. I get a lot of I get a lot of chill out of it. I tell you, <laughs> and that's where even just having this conversation, you can just hear it in your voice, right? See it in your face. It's just. <laughs> It, it is exciting, and it's where you can really help a lot of people see something that they didn't even they they weren't even aware as I was right learning about this slowly for the first time, and as you become exposed to it and aware of it, you realize wow, I can actually do this, and one of the first tools is is through your book, and that's 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 super exciting that you're willing to share this information with with the masses. Well, I, you know, it's, I'm so old now. I it's the only it's a legacy based thing basically. Basically, you know, it, it, I, I think it's I think it's unfortunate that um, our focus, you know, we are almost better off. We are almost better off in the old commission based way of running money. Uh, and you you dealt with the guys that were a little shady, you know, and would, would churn portfolios and stuff like that. Just trading just to enrich themselves. But now we have the focus a different kind of focus in it. It encourages a certain type of an investment and de discourages the safe, um, safe financial uh, of bonds and even in government securities, preferred stocks. Take a, take a hind seat to the stock market in today's with today's emphasis on uh, on market value. I think that's a bad thing. So take a minute, and we've been talking about the retirement money secrets. Take a few minutes and just tell everybody about the book. Give us a little bit of a premise. Uh, we've obviously talked about the closed-ended funds. You can learn a lot about that. But just, yeah, if folks are out there like, I want to learn more about what Steve's talking about here today. And we're, yeah, tell us more about the book. Okay, well, well the book really is a, um, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it takes place, it starts off in Amsterdam when my wife and I are, have met this couple from Virginia, actually, where my son actually lives. And um, we're, t we're talking to them about how we got here, how we, it boils down to we got, how did we pay for this type of vacation? And how do we do these vacations so often? And they've done a few and we've done so many. And, you know, what's the difference? What happens? And, and we explained that, that we did it using the income from our investments. And this guy who had probably a similar size portfolio to me um, had to sell securities to, to do what he did. And so that's, that's where it all started. So it starts in Amsterdam and it, it goes as far as a golf course in Kiowa to his place up in Richmond, where we finally talk and talk and talk about how you, what these, what, you know, what these four risk minimizers are and how important they are to investing and, and what closed end funds are and how they make it easy to diversify 
and generate income and take profits and produce income. How easy it is for that and how they still, they reflect the market cycle just like individual securities do. So you can, you can look around outside you and know what to expect in your portfolio. And so it, it goes through all of those things. And it gets, goes into depth into, uh, it provides a risk pyramid that actually shows you 40 different types of securities um, and where they fit on a pyramid of risk going to the top with all the income focused ones on the bottom because they're the safest. And then as you get further and further into equities, and then finally there are things that haven't, there are eight floors of this pyramid and there are things that didn't get in the pyramid because, because I think they are more risky. And, and, you know, if you don't have a million dollars or a bigger of our portfolio, you don't want to go near these types of things. They're too speculative. You can't, you can't afford to take that financial hit because it happens, you know, it happens. Planes fly into buildings, you know, stuff happens. We have no idea when it's going to happen. So, so it does. It does all that. It goes. You. It takes you into a um, a Q and A at, at my Facebook group, and the answers being raised by all these other investors of me and the answers. And it gives you uh, comparisons between a portfolio of closed end funds and uh, indexes that you know of, like Spy and and Bond BND, and how. Um, the difference of having an 8% cash flow versus a 4% withdrawal, the, how the market value actually is higher after a significant period of time if the income is greater than the expenses or the, or the withdrawals. You know, it just, it, it, goes, it goes everywhere. It, it, it goes everywhere. And covers a lot of information. It does. Which is super valuable. If for those who are wanting to learn exactly your way of, of investing for income. Right. And, and, and you can apply the principles of the, all the profit taking principles and that can be applied to things that I don't even talk about in the book, like BDCs, uh, business development companies and REITs and master limited partnerships. They're all the same. They're, you know, you can treat them the same from the profit taking and diversification sense. Okay. The quality is different with those. And some of them have tax implications. Uh, all of those different securities are in some closed end funds. So you don't have to go this individual route, um, which is very important for small investors because they can have instant diversification. And for large investors, they generate the income that these guys are really start like yourself are starting to think about in your case, 20 years from now, but you know, so it'll be here before we know it, that's for it sure. gets there quickly. It really does. It, it does. does. When I, when I, I just had a birthday. And when you think about, when you think about 79 and you say, Oh my God, you know, which you look fantastic you know, for 79. Congratulations. Well, thanks. But still it's there. It's real. You know, it's, it it's a real. scary, it's a scary thing. I don't know about next year, what we're going to do, but geez, I think we'll be in Hong Kong or something like that. You know, <laughs> I think I've, living off of your income. Exactly. I think the, year, right? the spending is going to increase. Yes. I, you uh, might as well enjoy it. Exactly. Put in all this effort so far. That's right. That's right. Yep. And you've put in so much effort with this episode today. You've delivered a ton of value and wisdom here with us here on the, on the podcast. I would love for you to, if there was one more piece of wisdom or experience or anything that you, you know, through your 79 years of experience of life in general, oh. definitely with the markets, is there anything you'd like to share with us today as we start to wrap this one up? I, th I think I've, my, the primary thing, there's, there's a primary thing and a secondary thing. And they're related. But the primary thing is to somehow, it's a mindset that we have, and that's really been thrust upon us by the institutions that, that run the markets. And that's that market value focus. If you can get yourself more income focused and start making investment decisions with that in mind, I think your long run success will be much better. And one other thing you should do if you're in a managed portfolio environment is simply to raise the question with your financial advisor. Ask him how much income is my portfolio generating? 
And what would it take to make that, to get that income up above that 4% bogey level? And if you ask him those two questions and get him thinking about it, buy him a copy of the book and maybe he'll get you there. So speaking of the book, we've talked about it a lot, Retirement Money Secrets. So take a couple minutes. I appreciate you sharing that last bit of, of wisdom there. But tell us where, if folks are out there like, okay, I need to figure out what Steve's talking about. I need to get this book. I need to get in his, his atmosphere and figure out more about it. Yeah, where's the Am- Amazon, of course, is the number one purveyor of books in the world anymore. But it's also at all the brick and mortar stores and any place you get your eBooks. And within a month, there will be an audio book available as, as, as well. And, uh, Fantastic. and I do have a website. If you want to direct contact, it's the income And, uh, there's information there, but generally if you, if you want to talk to somebody about this approach, that's the place to go. That's the place to go folks. So if, any of this that we've shared today intrigues you in any way, shape, or form, like it did me when I was first introduced to Steve's content and the things that he was producing. As I mentioned, he shared the book with me and I've started to dig into these closed-ended funds and I'm learning things that I've never heard before, which is exciting for me because what I've learned is as I've pushed myself through thoughts and ideas and the boxes that we've been put in growing up and you realize that Some of the things that we've been taught aren't necessarily the complete truth. I won't say that they're false, but they're not the complete truth. They're not the only way. When I've pushed myself out beyond that, that's when the magic starts to happen. You start to learn new things. You start to be able to implement new strategies in your life. And you'll quickly, relatively quickly, be able to exponentially grow where you are or where you were to where you're actually where you're headed. And that's kind of the feeling I get when I've been introduced here to Steve and this content that we've been discussing here today. I'm looking forward to digging into it personally, my own self, as deep as I possibly can to learn more about it. As I mentioned, I just turned 50 here a couple of weeks ago. And so I'm already starting to think about, okay, what happens when I don't want to work anymore? What happens when I want to be in Hong Kong on my 80th birthday? How am I going to make that happen? Well, this is definitely a way that you can start doing those strategies. And I highly recommend you grab that book, Retirement Money Secrets, to be a great place to start. And then obviously go to his website. We'll have all the links in the show notes. Uh, if you're are listening to us on the move, we'll definitely have those in the show notes. You can refer back to those in the, in the future or definitely when you have an opportunity. So, Steve, man, I appreciate you sharing so much with us. Uh, this has been a fun conversation. I look forward to learning more, right? I'm going to try to dig in as much as I possibly can and learn as quickly as I can. But I really, truly appreciate you spending your time with us here today. Well, it's been my pleasure, pleasure Randy. It was, yeah, good. It was a good conversation. Good. I'm glad it was for you as well. So folks, go out there, learn more about what we've been talking about today and take control of your own finances. Don't leave it up to someone else to do it for you. Uh, Just getting the information and the knowledge and the wisdom, and then you can then start asking the proper questions to the people that may be managing your, your, your portfolio or anything like that. But the idea is that you need to get the information first so that way you can ask the proper questions. So go out there, have a fantastic day. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, If you would share it with your family and friends that will help us spread the message here of the Rich Mind Podcast and help Steve get his message out there across the world as well. So focus on being great. Have a fantastic day. I look forward to bringing back the next guest again with you very soon. Until then, bye now.